beautiful day today. We're on, Scout and I are up on top of the Gayhard Hill. Some, I guess some old family named Gayhard used to live up here. Come here, Scout. So I thought, I was thinking of a joke a friend of mine told me once. Scout, so Scout's got his kind of, whatever you want to call it, foo-foo look to him. Reminded me a friend of mine said that uh, God granted him with a built-in, his face was God's built-in anti-adultery device. In that um, because of his face, he never had to worry about uh, ad adult committing adultery against his wife because he was so ugly. <laughs> uh, well, we bet at first this week we got to start off with some fan mail. I came home from the chiropractor and I saw this sitting on our kitchen counter and so I picked it up and so I read it and so I'm going to share that with you. Dear Billy, we need more young men like you. Thank you for being real. I so enjoy your hunts and Alaska trips. I am a 70 year old woman. You are in my prayers, also your fireside talks. Please keep doing what you're doing. I envy your wife. Sincerely, Nora. Nora is from New York, New York State. And so my wife, <laughs> my wife was there when I read it and uh, I said, yeah, you better pay attention, you know, you, she envies, uh, she envies you. I think you got it pretty good, woman. And uh, yeah, she, she got a pretty good chuckle out of that. But Nora, that was very, very sweet of you. And um, yeah, your handwriting reminds me of my grandma, my, my grandma Dora, she's 96. Uh, sweet, sweet lady. But anytime a guy gets a handwritten letter, um, I don't need to tell anybody, that's kind of a rare thing. So when you do get a, a letter that's written in, written in hand writing, that's, uh, you pay attention to those. So I thought that was very thoughtful and um, yeah, very nice, very nice. Today, we're gonna be talking about calling, calling animals. This is like uh, high, the high country for northwest Wisconsin. You get off the Mississippi, St. Croix rivers there, you get some bluffs and some hills like Buffalo County is about 100 miles south of here. Torgerson boys, perhaps. It's like a 185 or a 206. Um, uh, Where's it going with that? Oh, yeah, so Buffalo County is about 100 miles south of here, the Driftless area, it never got hit with glaciation. Uh, that's where the big bucks are, and there's some bluff country, some big hills there. But here we're relatively flat, lots of lakes. Minnesota has, it's called the land of 10,000 lakes. I don't know how many it has in total, but Wisconsin has 14,000 lakes particularly right around here where where I live. It's just, you can't hardly go um, two, three miles in any direction and not hit a lake here practically. Um, lots of them. But a beautiful day. Thought about building a house up here at one time, but really like where we're at. So calling. Uh, Kurt and Trent Packingham were my clients. I had guided Kurt sheep hunting many years, many moons ago. Got a nice ram, old ram. And then he called me, wanted to go moose hunting, and then his brother would go bear hunting. So I did a two-on-one deal with them. We started out in this spot. There was a lot of moose around, but like nothing, I shouldn't say nothing really close, but kind of, we tried, we tried a new spot and there was plenty of moose around. It was kind of, it was early in the season. We got a 21 day season. Starts the 5th of September, goes to the 25th. And that first, kind of the magic time is probably right at the 15th. You know, that's that perfect time. 15th to the 20th, I would say is probably the best time. 
but early on like that hunt was sometimes especially if it's warm the bulls aren't real responsive particularly the older bulls the rut's not kicked in far enough to where the older bulls are going to be real responsive and we're landing on ridge tops with super cubs and we're more or less calling the moose to us kind of the only way to hunt hunt that country no not many rivers that are navigable and then that eliminates competition too but we were hunting for a couple of days we were seeing some moose we saw one really nice bull i mean 65 inch class um he just popped out about a thousand yards away he heard her calling and he and he didn't come in and we kind of made a play on him that evening and then never never did see him again <clears throat> so we were probably three four days in we spotted one really big grizzly bear he was like three miles off kind of heading somewhat away from us it was late in the evening no way we could catch up to him so like fourth day something like that um We'd been hunting all day. It was nice. It was warm. The weather was kind of wasn't hot, but it was it was just too warm. It was getting cold that night, so it was kind of one of those deals where you had about you know three four hours in the morning were kind of ideal, but then the evenings it was just too warm during the day. Unless you knew where a bull was, the evenings you almost might as well forget about them. And we were up there glassing all day. And Kurt and Trent, they said, hey, we're, we're, we're tired. We're going back to camp for happy hour. We landed right on this ridge. We were able to glass right on that ridge top, basically. Our tent was maybe 400 yards from where we were glassing, just on the other side of the ridge. And so I said, hey, you guys go over to mix me a toddy and I'll, I'll be there, you know, I'll be back in 10, 15 minutes. I'm just gonna hang out here a little while longer. So I just figured maybe I'd catch a glimpse of something moving the last few minutes of daylight. Sitting there, they hadn't left five, 10 minutes. And I look up on this ridge and I see a bunch of animals silhouetted. I can see them moving. They're probably two miles away. And I'm like, what the heck is that? Is that uh, uh, caribou? There's few caribou around, but not many. So I thought it would be odd. So I threw my glasses up there and here it was wolves. So I think I counted like 12 of them. And they started, I kind of watched them a little bit, filmed them a little bit, and then they started kind of working down this ridge, kind of somewhat angling toward us. But I knew they weren't gonna get to us, you know, in time to shoot, because it was getting dark. So I ran back to camp, gra grabbed my stuff, ran back to camp just to show Kurt and Trent. I'm like, hey, check it out, you know, got to the camp and we could see them right from camp. They come down this ridge, they kind of loiter around a little bit, and a couple of them bed down and are like, oh man, that's cool. Well, there was 14 of them, 14 wolves. Um, I think there was five black ones and the other 11 were grayish, you know, somewhere in that scale. <laughs> Trent asked, well, what are the odds of them being there in the morning? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't know what a pack like that's gonna do during the night, but I gotta figure that they're probably not gonna be there, but who knows? So we wake up in the morning, eat, eat breakfast, kind of like we had been in the dark, you know, just got our tent. I was sleeping in a tent, I was cooking in it, and then uh, uh, Craig and, um, uh, Craig, who's Craig? Kurt and Trent, oh, I was thinking of my, I was thinking of somebody else. Uh, Kurt and Trent, they had their own tent, so they come into my tent, get some coffee going, eat some breakfast, just starting to break daylight, and I poke out, poke my head out, and I look, I glass, and I'm like, nah, I don't think they're there anymore start getting stuff ready a little bit later a little more daylight and i look out there and i'm like they are there they're still there they're bedded maybe there was a couple of them standing up i don't know i'm like oh man that's that's pretty wild you know so we're kind of getting ready kind of my pre first morning ritual moose hunting is i would call so i figure well let's just see maybe these wolves will respond and so i went gave a howl nothing happened i had a parmesan uh, cheese can that was my my megaphone that i was using to call just cut the bottom of it out they couldn't hear anything there's already a little bit of wind and so i think that was mainly the reason why they couldn't hear me well then i just figured well I tried it a time or two they didn't hear anything no response well, i just figured well might as well just call moose you know because they're the wolves are still a mile and a half away 
but they're kind of like at our level. There's kind of a series of the countries like rolling hills, fairly sparse, really not much spruce to speak of, but uh, a little bit of spruce, but there's alder and willow, but mostly open, I dare say, the hillsides, you know, so just open tundra, berries, that sort of stuff. And so they're kind of like one big saddle away, big broad sweeping saddle, and then they're kind of up on this little plateau where they're kind of overlooking. They got a basin, a fairly large draw, maybe two, two miles down, kind of wide and broad, and then another draw below them, kind of going down to this main river valley. So I suppose they're, you know, just sitting there, you know, they're always hunting, they're always working, you know. But they had a pretty good position to keep an eye out for stuff. So I went and I blasted a cow call. Well, all of a sudden, they just erupted. They started howling. All 14 wolves, they start howling. And then they gather together. They congregate into an area maybe 30 yards square, 40 yards square, something like that, or radius. And I'm like, holy smokes, you know, that got their attention. And I'm like, are you guys about ready to go? And they're like, yeah, yeah, pretty much. They were just kind of throwing the last things in their pack. Waited like 45 seconds. And I'm like, well, I'll try it again. They, they didn't move. They just gathered around. They're kind of facing our direction. So I blast out another cow call. And all of a sudden, bam, they just started loping right into us. They didn't make a peep but they just started right at us. So they, they just kind of, they weren't charging, they are just loping, trotting. And Trent's, as they're, we're sitting there watching them come in, Trent's like, all right, what's the game plan? I didn't know. <laughs> so we go out onto the ridge, not more than 200 yards from camp. It's kind of bald and it kind of drops off. Fairly steep, but we kind of found a little bit of a promontory and we just laid our packs down and, um, we just laid them out. We could see about straight in front of us, yeah, about 800 yards straight ahead, and then maybe as much as, you know, 200 yards either way. And I just figured, well, the top of this ridge is as good a, good a spot as any. So we didn't make any more sound, and we had the guys already prone, had them load up, and, and we weren't set up for maybe a minute, not even. And all of a sudden, here they come out of the timber. You know, the, the saddle was kind of, the far end of it was pretty well timbered with cover. And then from the halfway point to us, it was basically wide open. And so I started calling out ranges. I'm like, you know, just wait till they stop. You know, I'll tell you when to shoot. And so I'm like 800, 600, 700, 600, 500, 4, 3, 2, you know, and I'm finally, I'm like, okay, just wherever they're at, just hold on them at this point. But it was interesting, the farther away they were, there was only eight of them that came into view. So presumably the other six kind of trailed off or lagged behind or kind of coming up on the flanks. I don't know. But as they came forward, uh, when we first saw them, they were basically single file. And as they got closer and closer and closer, they slowly spread out and fanned out and started coming right towards us. So as they're coming to us about 120 yards, they're about to kind of go down. We had a little bit of a berm, maybe like 30 yards, yeah, maybe 50, 40 yards ahead of us. That kind of dropped off a little bit more. And so they were just about to kind of get out of sight of that you know in that little pocket where we couldn't see so there was a pocket between 40 yards and about 120 yards where we wouldn't really be able to see so I tried yip, 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 trying to stop them you know I figured 100 yards that's pretty close but they never heard or they just didn't care and they kept coming well now they're out of sight I'm like all right turn you know make sure your scopes are down low and get ready you know wait till they stop don't shoot till they stop and so they come popping up over the hill about 50 yards. I could see their heads and all of a sudden they pop up and they're finally they're in full view and they're still running pretty good. And I'm like, man, they're going to run right past us, you know. But the whole time that this is happening, I'm just like, this, this is incredible. I got this all on film and it's some of the best footage I've ever filmed. 
but I'm like, man, they're gonna run right past us. And it, to be honest, it was like a little bit intimidating, you know, seeing this pack of wolves just coming totally fearless, just nonchalant almost. I mean, it's like, I think they knew that, hey, that cow is dead. There's 14 wolves. Well, what's, if they, they as Troy Quaddy would say, if I want you, I will have you. And all, <laughs> that was kind of his pickup line with the girls. I'm a quaddy. If I want you, I will have you. A um, little bit off topic, but um, I mean, they, it's, um, it, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? So they pop, the wolves are over, 40 yards away, and I'm like, man, I got to get these things to stop because if they keep coming right by us, I, what my fear was is that one of the guys was going to move, you know, and then they, the wolves were just going to catch movement like that and, and scatter, kind of like a coyote, you know, they're, wolves are really cagey, you know, they're, they're smart. And so I didn't want them to just scatter and just never get a good shot. But in this area, we didn't need a wolf tag and the limit was 10 per day. So these eight wolves are coming and I'm like, holy smokes, what, we're going to shoot like six wolves. I'm going to be skinning wolves, you know all day long but as it were they, they come up yep 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 finally they get them to stop and i'm like take them boom kurt shoots drops the first one right in his tracks and then boom they all scatter boom well they, they go up over that um ridge i don't think anybody i don't know is that it, trent got a second shot because i think he was on the same one that kurt shot so as soon as he dropped kurt had to find another or trent had to try and find another one before he could do that, they get down and out of sight again. They're headed straight away. So they come back into view. They're 100, 120 yards away. And boom, I miss. And <clears throat> I tried howling. Yeah, I howled. And then the one stopped. Boom, they miss. I howled again. Boom, boom. They're, so I howled, howled again. The, the same one stopped again. Boom, boom. They both shot at the same time. Hit the same wolf. Just bam, bam. And dropped that one. And they may have taken another shot at them as they were running away. I don't just remember. But long story short, we got two out of the eight that came in. But it was it was incredible. I mean, it was it was it was amazing. You could hear the wolves howling off in the distance. And I'll never forget what Trent said. He's like, man, that whole time they were coming in, I felt like I was in a dog food commercial. <laughs> it was it was pretty wild. And so we uh we skinned out those wolves i assume that we shot the alpha male that lead um that lead wolf the pack hung around all day we saw them a couple of different times but they'd never come in you know i think they were you know looking for the other pack mates to come join them and eventually the following day they they you know they were gone we didn't see or hear of them anymore and then I think after that, after the, that pack went through and, and then we didn't see any moves, we kind of figured out, okay, it's time to move. Uh, so um, Matt and Emily come in, they move us, go to a different spot. We get settled in there and we're seeing moose right off the bat. Saw one pretty good bull with some cows, and they were like a couple miles away, down in some timber, pretty tough spot to go at them, and it was a long ways away, and we just kind of figured, well, we'll just see how it goes. That was the first morning. Then, um, I think it was like noon, we walked to a little different knob. It wasn't quite noon to where we could see a little better. Spotted this bull like 1130. He was a pretty good bull, about 60 inches. He was about two miles away. He kind of crossed out of this, came up out of this timbered bowl, big, 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 huge bowl. You know, I'd been calling all day. And he pops into view, I glass him, I said, yep, that's the bowl we want. Uh, you know, he's about 60 inches. And at 11 o'clock, usually bulls, particularly old ones, they're gonna bet around noon. So I, he went into some timber and disappeared. And I'm like, ah, he's gonna, you know, he's gonna bed for the day. I said, I doubt he'll come in tonight because he's not quite far enough into the rut. I said, I bet you we'll shoot him within 500 yards of the tent tomorrow morning. Because he was, I could tell he was pretty interested, you know, he was kind of looking my direction, our direction a lot, you know, and I'd call and he'd rake brush. It just seemed like his temperament was at that stage. He was obviously cruising, he was seeking. I'm like, we got a really good chance of getting this bull tomorrow, but we'll be ready for him tonight. 
we sat there all night, never saw anything. So my hunters or Trent and, and Kurt, they're kind of thinking, man, you know, that bull wandered off. There was a lot of timber there, so he could have easy, easily snuck out on us. So the next, that night, actually kind of, no, that was the deal. It stormed. It started storming that afternoon. So we, it, we got fogged in before dark, and so we went back to the tent, and it was whipping, it was spitting, it was nasty. Sat in the tent all morning, all afternoon. Finally, it's like six o'clock, and you still can't even hardly see. And Kurt's like, ah, I wanna just go walk up on the hill. We had camped down off of this little knob where we had landed, maybe about 100 yards. Got in some protection there, and I kinda wanted to stay sequestered and uh, keep a low profile scent wise and otherwise so i'm like yeah i said yeah it sounds good this might break up anyways i mean it was still pretty foggy you couldn't see and i'm like i'll just hike up there with you the precipitation had stopped and i figured it would probably break about the time we got up there there was just a few little sucker holes you could just barely see and so we hung around a little bit you know we were pretty quiet because moose are best senses hearing so we were sitting there kind of just watching the fog and every once in a while you'd just get a little break and you could glass just a little bit and I'm like you know I'm gonna go over on the other side of the ridge and peek over that way you know if you guys see something come over and grab me vice versa but just kind of basically stay in these two areas we're gonna separate by about a, no more than 100 yards but obviously when you do that you want to make sure you know where the other party is so that you can get one another if you need to so I go hiking over there and I'm just kind of lollygagging along, you know, through the fog and all of a sudden, I mean, it was like, like a curtain at a, at a, on a stage. It just like the, the fog parted and there's just this hole that just opened up and there's this bull moose standing right on this saddle at the head of this draw that was in between our tent and where we were calling from the last the evening before so we got our tent down here the knob we were calling from the evening before and then right in the middle there he is just sitting there just staring and listening you know with his antlers a moose's antlers are basically a satellite dish those palms sit out and then that sound comes in you know cow comes into heat or they're vocalizing the sound comes in hits the bull's antlers and they're perfectly uh, positioned and angled so that the sound reflects to their ears so I've called bull moose from five miles away and I mean other guys have too that's not you know you know I think I've probably talked about this before so that bull is just sitting there staring into that valley smelling listening you know the the thermals are coming uphill and he's just sitting there checking out where's that cow that I heard you know yesterday afternoon so I race back and I grab Kurt. I'm like, that, that bull's right there. I mean, we're talking 500 yards from the tent. And he looks at me like, yeah, right, you're, you're kidding. I'm like, I'm serious. So we sneak in and it kind of starts raining again. And we, we called to the bull. We, we, we got into position. We called to him a little bit to kind of draw him because it was pretty brushy where he was at. And we, long story short, we got him to come out he was maybe 400 yards from the tent yeah he was probably 400 yards from the tent um called him to within about 150 yards and kurt dumps the bull and it was pretty exciting you know it was kind of getting pretty late into the hunt and long story short we never did uh get a uh never did get a grizzly bear for trent never did see one at that spot we saw a, a black bear or two um, but never did get a, uh, never did see another grizzly. Well, then, so that, we got in a packer. That was kind of an interesting story. Um, yeah, that packer was, was an interesting dude. Yeah. He, uh, was telling me about all the people that he met in prison. <laughs> he was a pretty good packer. Good, good dude. His name was Nick. And uh, he met Bo Butcher Baker, this notorious serial killer. Um, so yeah, I don't know why, why Nick was in prison, but Nick was a good dude. Um, a hard worker. So, yeah, I didn't, didn't really anticipate sharing that into the story, but it adds a little bit of Alaskan flavor to it. So, 
yeah that was kind of kind of the end end of it you know uh, the hunt was all done and um but kind of my my whole point to lead into that was the effectiveness of calling and with moose that's primarily how i've always hunted them you know different country you gotta hunt use different methods but that's always been the best method that i've found and by and large you know sometimes you don't have to to use it and sometimes you know maybe spot and stalk you see a bull bed you're better off just sneaking up on them but without a doubt most of the moose that i've guided for have been called in that is the only time i've ever called in wolves and gotten one i've called a couple in before either before season or whatever uh, but usually the wolves have just kind of been happenstance just luck or you have a kill and then they'll come into the kill but what's interesting is when a wolf, like in one, if there's one or two, they'll come into a call or kill or anything like that. They don't have near the uh, audacity. They're not nearly as brave. They're a lot more cautious. Where when we had that big group, they were very, very bold, very confident. You know, they, they, they were fearless. They were fearless. And as I mentioned, as they're coming in single file, the wolves in back, undoubtedly, they're watching their leader, the, the alpha wolf. But as they get closer to where they know that this, or they think this cow is that they're going to kill, they start to spread out. So at that point, they kind of have to man up and, you know, you know, trust their own instinct. Yeah, they're, it's kind of like almost uh, probably a little bit like a V of, of geese or birds or something, you know, the, the lead one's still in front, but they're kind of fanned out as they get closer and closer and closer, more into hunting mode, you know. And I kind of think that we as humans were a lot the same way. You know, that's one of the stories that I use when I'm talking, doing corporate talks, you know, I talk about leadership because as a leader, you know, all eyes are on you, particularly when you're leading in the charge, you know, when you're starting off in a new direction or there's some trouble ahead, you know, that's when a leader's got to step up. But when it come, comes time to do battle, you know, everybody's got to kind of assume their position and, you know, tackle their role, address their role, do, do their job. But I also, I thought of this just the other day, in a spiritual realm, and throughout our lives, we're, we're all being called to. Every day, particularly with the depression device, or as my young friend Jake Merdut called it, a, a dopamine dispenser, we're all being called by something non-stop like never before in human history we have a lot of like people would call them blessings but we also have a lot of curses and i'm here to tell you i'll be the first to admit i mean i use this thing i kind of i bring it here out on these in case i ever want to pull up a bible where something comes to mind i can find it quick but um Man, I, when I go to Alaska, I am so happy to get away from a cell phone, emails, phone calls, and just, we're so stinking accessible. We're being torn, and our attention is being pulled and stripped from us all the time. And if you watch, I call it man-made distraction. Well, like, when I come back into town and I see brake lights, you know, and I get back from Alaska and I'm gone a couple of months, man, it just, it, it just like, ah, uh, it, like, it's like this, my spirit just gets kicked in the balls. I don't know how to describe it. I mean, I, I guarantee you there's a lot of people that kind of know what I'm talking about. So I want to try to like put this into perspective, but what I love about my job is the lifestyle. It's like all you basically have to think of is just staying alive 
and then react to your environment of what's going on. It's like your mind is like basically empty all the time. I mean, yeah, you're, you're thinking, you're daydreaming, really. But you kind of head out with a plan and let's say like with us moose hunting, you're basically going to go up on a knob, sit there and you're just going to call all day and then you just wait until you see something and then you react to it. Whatever it is, you just react. Whether it's the weather or you see a bear or wolves or moose or whatever, you just react. You know, you, you can only plan so much. In our daily world, you know, we're constantly getting information and then we're having to discern it and figure out whether it's useful, whether we follow it, whether we ignore it. That stuff wears me out. I mean, it, like... I mean, it could drive a guy insane. I mean, and there's plenty of people that that's happening to them right now. Um, you know, and like ADD, you know, teachers had told me that I had ADD. I mean, I, I, I mean, I believe that there's differences in people, you know, and how they handle things or stimuli that are around them. But I, I just think that I don't know. I, don't, I guess I don't really think that I really believe in that label. I just believe that people that are like that maybe don't belong in the public education the way they have a system. And then to be taking, you know, then to be taking drugs for it. I've got a friend that has been on like the medication for that for several years and like 15 years. And he said he tried to get off of it and he said he just, he was worthless. He, you know, I suppose to some degree he gets kind of addicted to it. And he just said, I can't, I can't focus, you know, he's just like the simplest things just, he's like, I, I got to get back onto that medication. And that, I mean, that's scary, man, is that scary. I'm, I think I maybe went in one time and I think I maybe got medication for it, but I, I never did take it. I'm just like, man, I don't want, I don't want it. Cause I'd heard about people how it kind of like numbs your personality and kind of like dulls you down and, um, I, I kind of, I would bet that I would be like clinically diagnosed for it, I, I, I would guess. I mean, I have looked into it a little bit, but, but I think all that means is that you're just not meant to do the status quo. So let me get back to my point here, because there's so many things calling us. And kind of the reason why I've brought up I don't want to bring up politics per se, but I feel like it's such a stark, um, and I'm not going to talk about it, but the reason why I have been like current events is when you look at what what's happening in our countries, and if you've studied the Bible much at all, you can just, there is no other way to um, to like, there's nothing else to call what's happening, many of the things that are happening, anything but evil. And so I'm sure there's some things that are, you know, that are calling to us that are kind of, you know, just daily chores that we have to do or whatever. They may be kind of mundane. But by and large, most things that are calling for our attention that we're having to decide whether we do, whether we listen, whether we follow or not, it's either good or evil. And in the case of these wolves and that moose, they listened to a call that they shouldn't have. Two of the wolves and that bull moose paid for it with their life. You know, as a hunter, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to trick the animal and you know, we were successful at doing it. But as humans, if the Bible's true, and there, I believe that it is, there's, you know, it just, I'm, I was convicted many years ago, and the more I study it, the more I believe it. So there's nobody, nobody's going to change my mind. But at the end of days, there's going to be a reckoning for the calls that we spent our life listening to. And if you're listening to 
the flesh, the ways of the world, which ultimately is sin, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And Jesus said, no one will enter the kingdom of heaven. No one will come to the Father except through me. So that's a, that's a call. And in Revelation, I think it's 3.20. I don't have it marked here, but... Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will con come into him and dine with him, and he with me. Jesus is willing to accept anyone. Anyone who is, who, re who is willing to open the door and receive him. To answer his call. Through repentance for one sin through declaring Jesus Christ as Lord and to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus and to walk anew, to become a new person, to leave their old sinful nature behind and follow Him, to follow His calling, whatever He calls us to do, for the rest of our life. That doesn't mean that he's not going to lead us into storms, into tribulation and trials, because he will. Again, it isn't cruise control. Jesus doesn't just lead you down the broad, easy path. In fact, he says narrow is the gate. Narrow is the path. You will have trials and you will have tri tribulations, and that's how you're going to learn. That's how we all learn. It's the hunts that are the most difficult, the most challenging. Those are the ones that I look back on that are the greatest hunt. Every hunter is the same way because those are the ones that change you. Those are the ones where you learn. Those are the ones where going into it, you didn't realize it, but you had a weakness. And when you come out the other side, that weakness is gone and it's now you have an extra strength. That's, that's the path of being a Christian the way I see it. Man, that was pretty good. I think. Makes sense to me. I hope it made it sense to you. Here we are in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel, so this is Paul <coughs> talking to the Galatians. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him, Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant to Christ. Being a Christian is, being, is becoming less and less popular. The callings of Christ, I guess they're always there, but I mean there's fewer workers right now sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And many, I think there's more and more wolves, as the Bible says, uh, sheep in wool, or wolves in sheep's clothing, who are sharing false gospels. And that's something that I'm, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if I'll like misstep. I mean, I, I, I will. Um, I would say, I mean, the gospel message that that I'm sharing, I believe to be unequivocally true. Um, but many of the churches today, they're giving watered down gospel messages. Um, Joel, Joel Osteen is a kind of a perfect example. It's, um, um, 
I mean, basically he's a motivational preacher, you know, he kind of just base maybe tickles the ears. And I used to get in debates with other people and I'm like, well, but, but there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I said it, it, it's, you know, it's leading people to God eventually, you know, it's, it's perking their interest. But what many people told me, and I've kind of, I've basically come to understand, he's like, yeah, but if you don't tell people the whole truth, you're misleading them. Trying to think that there's there's a verse that's kind of like I'm scratching for that just came to my mind, and that's that's one thing you definitely don't want to do. You, I mean, you have to tell them the truth. If you're not going to tell people the truth, I mean, you're perverting the gospel, and that's what he's doing. He's he's just taking little bits of scripture, and that's very, very common, in um, you know, in religion and in, in televangelists, they'll give you like one verse. You know, John three sixteen is a classic example. I mean, yeah, that verse is powerful, but you've got to get the context that surrounds it to understand. Um, you know, if you read John three sixteen. And if, if you think that's all you'd have to do to be saved is just believe Jesus and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But go and read 1 John. Um, yeah, go, go and read 1 John and then you'll realize that there's a lot more to being a Christian than just believe because that's what a lot of churches are going to say and they're going to be just fine with you coming to church every Sunday and they're going to shake your hand and call you brother for, for nothing more than that. There's a reason why the Bible's so long. There's a lot more to it than that. I mean, granted, that's important and that's probably like the, the center point, if you will, is to believe, definitely to believe Jesus is the Son of God. But there's a lot more to it than that. That is a, uh, if that's all you know, that's a deceptive call. Because the Bible, uh, Jesus said that the multitudes will be turned away. They will say, well, we knew you. And he said, uh, I knew you not. Depart from me. Other uh, verse that I had here. Uh, I didn't really mark this very well. Sorry about this. Hmm. I got the page marked, but I guess I never uh, marked the words. My apologies. My apologies. Um, chapter 6, there. I got this one in a text message, and so I read it just today, and so it hit me. Yeah, okay, so I think I was right. Chapter 6, verse 10, yeah. Uh, talk about the armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Truth. That, that, is, that is your breastplate. That is your sword. That is your balm to heal you. That is everything you need to get through this earth outside of discernment what are you listening to and then that's and that's like your your radar really i guess the truth is to know 
um, if you're listening against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Because I am here to tell you that the devil is laying in ambush. That's all. He is the destroyer. The Bible says that a house divided cannot stand. Why do you think all this division is coming into our world? That's the devil's design. That's the way he wants us. It's the old tact, oldest tactic in the book. Divide and conquer. Nobody knows it better than the devil. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. When, when Jesus was with Peter, he was, he was sinning. Jesus, when, when, um, when Jesus told Peter that he was going to be crucified, Peter said, absolutely no way. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. But when Jesus died and the Holy Spirit came into Peter, Peter was an unstoppable force. So the Holy Spirit, at least in some realm, I mean, maybe, maybe this is like a little bit of a stretch, but I mean, is giving us more power than being with Jesus in and of himself. I mean, when Jesus called to Peter and was it brother Andrew, I believe, I'm pretty sure, yeah. You know, he called to them. They basically left their nets, they left their father, and they just left everything and they called him. Or they followed him. So, I mean, clearly they knew that there was something about Jesus that was undeniable that they, they knew they needed to follow him. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get back to this. Praying always with all prayer and suppl supplication in the Spirit. <clears throat> Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, the utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an amb ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Uh, Paul was in prison much of his ministry, so I assume that that means that he's in... <clears throat> I could look that up, but I guess I didn't. I apologize for that. But I'm guessing he is in chains. He's in, or at least he's in prison at that point. Um, yeah, I won't read the rest. There's really nothing there. Um, but that's how bold he was. That's how real it was. That's how strong that calling was is it was totally undeniable. There was, there was no other calling that came first. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Um, um, Jesus said the law of the prophets can be something, and I've said this a million times, um, because I'm, I'm, I ain't real intelligent, so I gotta keep it pretty simple. Um, I love God before all things and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're loving God before all things, I mean, that's, that's your ultimate calling, and that's our, that is our ultimate calling in this life. We're going to be called, we're going to be um, distracted all the time. And another word that I've, you know, I'm, I guess I'm kind of preaching for myself. I'm, I'm not really preaching, I'm just, I, I guess I feel the only way that I can really help people is to... Um, basically just share my walk. You know, it'd be like me taking you hunting in Alaska. The best I can do I, I, is, is just teach you what I've learned. You know, and this is what I've learned is that discernment is everything, is to know what call to listen to, what call not to listen to. And that's why you have to be in the Word. If you're just going to some church and just listen to a preacher once a week, you're basically just, you're just following the alpha wolf. Okay, Jesus said, come to me, follow me. That's who we are to follow. We're not, yeah, you've got a pastor that's, you know, going to help you. That's going to be your spiritual guide. Yes, you know, um, you know, there's, there's people that, that are able to teach you things um, that you don't know. There's no doubt about that. But ultimately, the one we are to seek is Jesus Christ.
Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. I thank you for my family. I thank you for Nora, who was kind enough to write me a handwritten letter of uh, appreciation and encouragement. Lord, I'd, I ask that you you promise us wisdom. Anyone who prays for wisdom, there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. And it seems like oftentimes the more knowledgeable we are and the more self-confident that we are, the less wisdom either that we have or that we show or that we use. Lord, grant every one of us that are praying here today discernment. Discernment to recognize your calling and to be able to decipher evil callings that would lead to our destruction. Embolden us to follow your calling, to walk away from our old sinful ways and leave them behind. And you promise that our old sinful life, you will, you will never remember it as far as the east is from the west. Lord, I ask for a special blessing over Don Johnson and his family. Lord, I ask that you continue to heal him and give him and his family strength. Lord, I ask that you be with Barry and Karen, Jeff, Riley, uh, April, Nate, Jeff, and Caleb. I ask that you be with Tom, with Hunter. with Matea, with my family, Lord, with Kim, and all those who are seeking you, Lord, help them to know and recognize your knock at the door that you are calling to them. You will convict them, you convict us all when we're following the wrong call, when we are being led into an ambush, a trap of destruction. Lord, I'd ask that you will just speak more clearly than ever to help others to turn from their sinful ways the broad path that leads to destruction and follow you through the narrow gate that leads to salvation and eternal life in jesus name we pray amen um oh quick note uh so i got a hold of uh, joe rogan's um or yeah I, I guess i sent an email to to joe rogan my wife had it all ready for me so when i turned on my computer one day it was right there to type a letter i wrote a paragraph to joe rogan to try to get on his podcast i got a hold of his um assistant um and so he said yeah he goes interesting he said if um joe wants you on could you come down to austin and i'm like absolutely you know so i haven't heard anything back but if you're so inclined to um <clears throat> not asking you to uh, do it again if you already have but if you haven't if you would you know you don't have to inundate them but i just think that i i, I believe that joe and i would have enough common ground where i could um, um really open his eyes to wilderness adventure you know he hunts and he has a lot of uh, um, unique guests on and I, I would love to talk hunting with him and kind of open his eyes to the wilderness the power of the wilderness and and you know, ultimately, if I could, uh, I'd find one way or another where I'd edge in, in a gospel message in there if, if I got any any time on his platform. So um, if you'd be so inclined to do that, I would really appreciate it. And again, just the continued support from all of you, just emails, phone calls, handwritten letters, I really do appreciate it. And above all else, I really do appreciate the prayers uh, um, for my family. Um, for me personally, a couple episodes ago, I kind of 
shared what I'm going through physically and you know my physical body it is very much a spiritual battle um, yeah I'm doing I feel I'm doing pretty well with it um, and just the more I it seems like the more I put God first place and seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness it seems like it um, you know the, the physical body really follows and, and it's time when I get in pain, then fear strikes up, and then all of a sudden I start focusing on myself, and it almost seems like, you know, the pain and the discomfort gets worse. It's, I'm still wrestling through it, um, but I really do appreciate uh, all your support, your prayers. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's pretty well it. I think I had a challenge for everybody, but I don't just remember exactly what, what it was. But yeah, hit the books, man. Study the Bible. Um, yeah, just, just find find a time every day, I dare say. For me, it's in the morning. Um, as soon as I wake up, I just anymore. Like, my day is just not right if I don't do it. And it's just like anything. It's just getting into the habit of doing it. Once you get into the habit, it's you, you're, you're not going to be able to imagine your life without it, you know. Um, so, yeah. He's, he's the one that we want to, got to follow. That's the call that you want to listen to. You don't want to get caught in a trap someday and uh, get caught in an ambush because it's happened to many people. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. If you're, if you're living in sin and there's, you know, you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, eventually it'll catch up with, with you. And... Jesus said that he has come, that we may have life to the full and have it abundantly. That's the call that we are to pursue. Right, Scout? Yeah, I'll give you a little tour of this joint. We're at the top of the hill. So this is uh, in my parents' farm. This is our sledding hill in the wintertime. My dad piles snow up here, and, and then they run down the hill. This is one of my dad's deals. I don't know, they were going to pull this out, throw it in the woods, and he put it on an old... Uh, potato wagon and doesn't really get used much but we'll have some campfires out here in the winter time get a nice winter's day and the kids go sledding and we enjoy the view got an eagle soaring over there till next time trust the guide planting corn on the moles farm today